people in Beirut have been more than physically wounded. They are invisibly mutilated, as surely as the buildings of the city have been damaged. In 17 years as a reporter in Beirut, I've watched them change and seen the effects of a war turn them into different people. I've watched a friendly Muslim population turn to hate the West. I've watched it happen among the Palestinians and in Egypt too. I've been a witness to that same Muslim hatred for the West in Bosnia. When I arrived in Lebanon in 1976, I never dreamt I would still be here today. Wars, invasions, massacres and kidnappings. I reported them all and am still surprised I didn't fall victim to them. My Lebanese colleague, Hanadi Salman, has found a Muslim Shiite woman she wants me to meet, a refugee from the south whose son was killed fighting the Israelis. How often have I seen these pictures of dead young men? But he was a member of the Hezbollah, I think, wasn't he? Martyrs, their mothers always call them. Gone to paradise, they fondly believe. Martyrdom, paradise, death. The Hezbollah, the fiercest enemy of Israel and America in the region, believe in all three. How familiar these slogans have become to me. The Independent is the only British newspaper with a staff reporter in Lebanon, and I'm based here as their Middle East correspondent. From Robert Fisk, Beirut, the slogans were familiar, point. Death to America, point. Death to Israel, point. Death to, quote, the American Zionist plot, unquote, point. But echoing yesterday... Living here has allowed me to see Lebanon as others have not, from close up on the very edge of events that have shaped the history of the region. Why have the Muslims of Lebanon shown such anger towards the West? Journalists are criticized for asking questions like this, especially when the world has been told there's going to be peace in the Middle East. And it's not always easy to understand the answers. Truth is that all sides in the Middle East conflict are guilty of lies, treachery and deceit.
But if you want to understand how so many Muslims came to hate the West, it's not enough to listen to the slogans of the Hezbollah. The Hezbollah have two allies, Iran, which gives them support and money, and Syria, which has 35,000 soldiers in Lebanon. But to see Iran's influence, you must travel across this damaged country and drive the two hours to Baalbek. For many years, almost the only Westerners to come to Baalbek were the British and American hostages imprisoned here. All other Westerners were treated as potential spies for Israel, whose air force was trying to locate Hezbollah targets in the town. Ayatollah Khomeini and his Islamic revolution in Iran were the Hezbollah's inspiration. I sometimes wonder if the willingness of Iranians to die for their faith didn't amount to a fascination with death, something they passed on to the Lebanese Shiites. Black flags and mourning symbolize not just this commemoration of the Ayatollah's death, but the Hezbollah's war of resistance against Israel. A war that goes on despite the PLO's peace agreement with Israel. The Iranians sent revolutionary guards here to Baalbek. They trained the Lebanese militia. But it all started with Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982. That year changed Lebanon forever. It changed us too, made our lives as journalists more dangerous. They were violent, terrible days. Journalists are witnesses to history, and I watched it all. Violence is political as well as physical. During those hot, frightening months, I watched Muslims die in their thousands, killed by the Israelis, by weaponry which was, for the most part, made in America. And if Israel was their enemy, was it so surprising that so many Muslims came to regard America as their enemy too? We watched them die in the hospitals, burned, crushed. We even saw babies who'd been killed by Israeli phosphorus shells. There's no doubt what horrified me most at the time. Massacres are difficult to forget when you've seen the corpses. At the end of the invasion, in the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, Israel's allies slaughtered hundreds of Palestinians while the Israelis watched. My colleague Hanadi was out of Lebanon at the time, but for anyone who was there, the memories are as fresh as if the killings happened yesterday. And then as I walked up here, the first thing I saw were horses, dead horses, behind, around where that white building is. And I thought to myself, why would anyone kill a horse? And we hadn't, still hadn't seen anyone dead. And as we got just up here, just a, maybe 20 yards more, we saw two women lying on the ground on their backs with their clothes torn, middle-aged women, and sort of things scattered around them. I don't know, I thought they were maybe teapots, maybe they were brewing tea when the gunman came and shot them. And just beyond them, behind their heads, lying on the ground, was a, was a baby that was dead with a bullet in its head. It was a while when we were in here, it was quite a while before we realised that the Christian gunmen whom the Israelis had sent in were, were still in the camp. We heard shooting. So we all got very frightened. And at one point, my two colleagues, Carsten and Lauren, they were somewhere over there. And I could, I could hear them talking, but I didn't know where they were. And I was shouting, Carsten, Lauren! And you could still hear this shooting. And there was a kind of earth embankment, just like this one. 
the place has changed so much and you new buildings, but there was an earth embankment like this, and I tried to climb over it, and I got on top, and when I was on it, it became all kind of spongy, and it, it moved up and down. And I realized it wasn't an earth embankment, it just had a covering of earth. And when I looked down, I saw a face, an elbow. They were all bodies, and was somebody's stomach. And I just literally held my breath and jumped off the other side and went running down that, that road down there, because that's where I could hear my friend's voices. I was so, so frightened at the time. There were bodies scattered all over here. Civilians, all of them. We never saw a gun. Never saw a gun next to anybody here. And the big question we were asking ourselves when we came in here was answered when we stood here and looked up there. Because we were asking all the time, did the Israelis know what was going on? And I'd been in the camp maybe two hours before I got to this point, and I looked up at that building, and I saw the flash, the sunlight catching binoculars, the flash on the glass. And when I looked at it carefully, I saw Israeli soldiers on the top. And they were obviously looking at me, so they could see the bodies, so they knew what was happening. I watched the American Marines arrive to protect the Palestinians, but Washington decided to support the Israeli-sponsored Lebanese government. American firepower was then directed at Muslim militias. The Muslims were bound to take their revenge. What happened next was to be a trauma in modern American history. Early on the morning of October the 23rd, 1983, a Muslim drove a truck bomb loaded with two tons of explosives into the US Marine base. The largest bomb since Hiroshima killed 241 Americans. The Americans regarded the suicide bombing as an act of mindless terrorism. The Muslim fundamentalists saw it as their greatest victory against Israel's closest ally. The most powerful army in the world had been struck down by a country without an army. were they, these young Americans? Innocent, naive, brave no doubt, inevitably doomed, recording their tragic role in history without realizing their fate. The Americans had firepower, the Muslims who bombed them claimed they had God on their side. Technology versus God, an equation that was to have ferocious results in Lebanon. The man was wearing green fatigues and driving a yellow truck. And he says, as the man went by, he says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. He says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. He says he always remembered that the guy was smiling. A frightening new weapon had been introduced into the Middle East conflict, the car bomber, as dedicated as any kamikaze pilot, even allowing his comrades to film his own immolation. In the years to come, those of us who lived in Lebanon watched this phenomenon grow. Would-be suicide bombers, some of them inspired by Syria as well as Iran, 
would record their last messages for the world to watch only hours after they had departed for what they thought would be paradise. Beirut sometimes seems too friendly a city to produce such men. But there are answers. To speak to the Hezbollah leadership, a journalist must travel to Beirut's southern suburbs. Poverty here mixes easily with faith. The Hezbollah live here, their militiamen, their supporters, their wives. Would-be martyrs often come from these southern suburbs. The man who runs the Hezbollah, who directs their war against Israel, is Hassan Nasrallah. Did he want to take his war into Israel, I asked him? We hear of Muslims going to their death happily, joyfully, even smiling. Can you explain this, Sayyid Nasrallah, to a Westerner like me? هذه المعاني تجعل الإنسان الذي يقاتل أو يوكب كما قلت شاحنته ويدخل إلى قلاع العدو ليفجر نفسه ويستشهد يدخل مطمئن القلب مبتسم سعيد لأنه سينتقل الموت في عقيدتنا ليس فناء ليس نهاية شيء وإنما هو بداية حياة حقيقية أفضل تشبيه للإنسان الغربي حتى يفهم هذه الحقيقة تماما كما لو كان هذا الشخص في حمام السونة في داخل حمام السونة وبعد ساعات عديدة هو عطشان جدا متعب جدا مشوب يعني على دوجة عالية من الانفعال بالحرارة وقيل له إذا فتحت الباب ستدخل إلى غرفة ناعمة هادئة الكوكتيل ينتظرك والكلمة الطيبة والموسيقى الكلاسيكية سيفتح الباب ويدخل بكل سعادة لا يشعر أن ما تركه غالي بل يشعر أن ما هو قادم عليه أغلى بكثير لا أستطيع أن أجد مثال آخر الآن حتى أوضح هذه الفكرة لإنسان غربي. For the West, there was an especially dark side to militant Islam. As their hatred for foreigners grew, so foreigners became individual targets. Groups like Islamic Jihad, with ideologies similar to the Hezbollah, identical perhaps, began to abduct Westerners in the streets of Beirut. These were dangerous, frightening days for us. To avoid being identified, we changed cars frequently, eyes on the rear view mirror, always watching for the overtaking gunmen, the shark-like cars that would cruise the seafront. We Westerners like routine, the nine o'clock drive to the office, the one o'clock lunch. So I avoided routine. I went to work in the middle of the afternoon, eight in the early hours. I booked seats on Lebanese airliners with no intention of flying on them. Let the kidnappers wait on the airport road for me, in vain. Make it difficult for them to find me. All of us, Lebanese and Westerners alike, lived in fear of the underground prison. 
There were dozens of them, just like this one, four floors below ground in West Beirut. Britons and Americans spent years in prisons like this. We publicized their plight, but we largely ignored the suffering of 17,000 Lebanese who were also kidnapped, almost all of whom were murdered by their captors. Several Lebanese were murdered in this very prison. In 1980, an Iranian hit squad led by a Lebanese, Anis Nakash, tried to kill the Shah's last prime minister in Paris. Seized by the French police and sentenced to prison, he was released after Iran demanded his freedom and after Islamic Jihad allowed three French hostages in Beirut to go home. Anis Nakash, a free man now, here surely is someone who might try to justify the holding of those Western hostages. Uh, French government, American government, English government, they were always implicated in the politics of the Middle East, implicated in the problem of Palestine, implicated in the problem of to support Israel and the aggressivity of Israel against our people. They were implicated in the war between Iran and Iraq. And they didn't ask themselves if it was right to support them, if the Iranian people was innocent, if it, the Iraqi people was innocent or not. So I mean, when they decide a political decision, they don't care about innocent. This is the big lesson. I am sorry to say that the big government give to the poor people like us to the small country, they give us the lesson there is nothing to think about the innocent, what is innocent, when we calculate political uh, situation. But if one takes the case of, say, John McCarthy, the British journalist, or, or my close friend Terry Anderson, the American journalist, these men were truly innocent. There was no way you could say they were involved in any security services or anything yeah. else. In the case of Terry, his father and brother died while he was in captivity for seven years. Mm -hmm. Could you find a way of justifying that on any personal level? No, there is no any justification for this. But there is explication. And there is difference between I justify and I explain. Because now our people, when you see innocent, I, as I told you before, they say, yes, they were in jail for six years or five years maybe, innocent, but every day we have innocent, they are died just like yesterday, you know, for example, in South Lebanon, a boy, children, women, family, complete family, houses destroyed by the aggression of Israel, and they are also innocent, and nobody do anything to stop this aggression. The headquarters of the Hezbollah is in Beirut, but its war is 60 miles to the south, where Israel occupies a strip of Lebanese territory from which the Muslim militia have pledged to drive it out. Israel says the area it occupies is necessary to protect its northern border from guerrilla attack. Its front line inside Lebanon consists of a series of fortresses running like crusader castles the width of the country. The Muslim villages below them, mostly civilians but with Hezbollah men living there as well, are at the mercy of Israel's hilltop guns. <laughs> Daily, the Hezbollah attack the Israeli occupation troops. Daily, the Israelis shell the villages. Invariably, under Israeli air and artillery assault, it's the Lebanese Muslim civilians who suffer and who respond with anger. The Israeli jets with the most advanced American technology, okay, they come and they just turn the house upside down. A guy 
uh, a kid, he's like maybe 15 or 16 years old, okay, just uh, 200 meters from here. Uh, they took him like four days. It took, you know, the rescue workers to try to dig deep to find pieces of his body. Why? What, what did this kid do to you? I mean, it, it just puzzles me. How can the world just watch on and do nothing? It's just amazing. And then talk about, you know, uh, basic human rights. I mean, the, 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 the right to live. Even it's not respected. بقولوا عنا حضارة وعنا نحنا مع الشعب وبجية وبسمينا نحنا إرهابية بتطلعي عبيتي عبيتي وأنا بدي أزعبك من بيتي كن أنا إرهابي واللي بيجي ملاك عبيتك وبيحتلك وبيدو يزلك ما إحنا ما بنقبل ينزل. She was injured during a shelling on Nabati, and uh, they brought her here. Uh, she was shocked, and there was some pieces of uh, bumps in her abdomen. She had a lot of uh, blood lost, and uh, today she was worse. And we had to reopen her because it's usually after a bomb injury, we have some complications because it's infected. مع الطريقة وهربانين من البيت ضربوا صاروخ تاني ما عادش عرفنا حالنا نحن وين كل واحد راح لعمل تاني يعني تخبينا ماما قصرت وصارت تنزف تكرت انه ماتت لما صرت عيط لها وصرخ لها كنا نعيط لبعضنا ما نسمع من جدار صوت طيارة ما نسمع شيء ان ماما استشهدت ماتت ما عاد تحكي شيء لانه ما عاد فيها انقطع نفسها بس لما طلع خي حملا وجابا لأنها عم تنزف. Even children are uh, wounded, and uh, three weeks ago there was a shelling on Arab Salim, and we had two children dead. One with an opened thoracic cage and without one uh, lung, and the other was uh, injured uh, on her head, and she died. I've traveled to see the United Nations in southern Lebanon more than a hundred times. They've been there since 1978, when the UN demanded an Israeli withdrawal. But the Israelis paid no attention. And like the Muslims of Bosnia, the Muslims of southern Lebanon can't rely upon the UN to protect them. The UN can patrol, but it can't stop the war. And here is a shell that's fallen to here. And we have a tank that has just landed down here. This road, Nick, looks like the kind of road I wouldn't walk down in Lebanon. It's got muck all over it. Have you been down here recently? Uh, in the past three weeks, uh, it's it's considered dangerous. Why? Uh, because we're all, we're, it, it is covered by both uh, Israeli back compounds. Mm -hmm. and they up here and up here. Yes, and they tend to fire in it with heavy machine gun fire. Mm. Uh, which is quite a long range. What about these trees? It looks like sort of gorilla <coughs> cover. Is it well, what the Hezbollah use? They're, they are using this recently as a launching pad uh, to attack uh, this compound um, because they have good cover with the trees and the wadi here. They won't be seen until the last minute. The Hezbollah have never before allowed their fighters to appear on Western television. The Israelis have already assassinated their former commander and they bomb the Hezbollah bases almost daily. The party of God is jealous of its security. These two men, less than 500 meters from an Israeli position in southern Lebanon, expect to die in their war against Israel. فقتال إسرائيل هو واجب شرعي أولا للدفاع عن كرامتنا وللدفاع عن حقوقنا وعن أرضنا وعن الشعب جميعا يعني حزب الله هو ثورة هو حركة جهادية ليس تنظيم معين يسلكه جميع الناس إنما هو خاص هذا هذا الباب هو خاص للمؤمنين فقط ف 
هذا هو انطلاقتي يعني انطلاقتي في حزب الله انطلاقه عقيده وانطلاق مفهوم في ذاتي انا والعالم كله عم يتفرج وبيقول يا حرام اذا جرحت لشي طفله باسرائيل بالسنه مره بيقوم العالم كله بيقول بس يوميا يوميا اطفالنا ونسائنا وشبابنا وشيوخنا عم يذبحوا وعم ينقصف عليهم بال بالقرى الامنه وما حدا عم بيحرك ساكن العدو الصهيوني نحن اللي عم نطلع نواجهه مش هو عم بيواجهنا بقذائف وقذائف وصواريخ وما بتهمنا ابدا نحن مبتغانا الشهاده نحن عم نروح نواجهه عم نقتحم قلب الحصون تبعه العدو مشان النال الموت والنال الشهاده وبنعتبر انه اللي الله ما وفقه يعني لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله بيكون وفق انسان غيره الله اختاره بيكون مقرب لله اكثر Sometimes Israeli civilians are also killed. How do you feel when you hear that an Israeli woman and child, for example, have been killed? أي طفل بالعالم مش ضروري يكون مسلم إذا مات بريء بتألم عليه أكيد وبتأسف بس بالوقت ذاته بحمل المسؤولية لدولته لأنه هي معتدية على شعبنا يعني شعبنا إله كل الحق إنه يرد إنه يرد وين ما كان في حال إن وجع الشعب يعني وقت الإسرائيل بتيجي تقصف بطيران وتقصف المدنيين وتقتل الأطفال والأبرياء إذا شعبنا رد وعمل ردة فعل وراح من المدنيين عندهم المسؤولية بتتحملها إسرائيل مش شعبنا اللي عم بيدافع عن حقوقه وعن أرضه. In Lebanon in the Middle East as a whole, who do you hold responsible for the events that are taking place here? واقعا في كلمة جوهرية قال إمام الخميني المقدس إنه إن كل مصائبنا هي من أمريكا. In southern Lebanon, the dead can be more important than the living. This cemetery in the village of Jibshit holds more dead Muslim guerrilla fighters per square meter than anywhere else in Lebanon. It's a place of reverence for the Shiites who live here, most of all to the relatives of the Hezbollah gunmen. Was he afraid of death? <laughs> ويرجع مثل الغزير هو كان هاك كان هو يتمنى هاك هو كان يتمنى هاك يظل يتمنى هو الشهاد ومثل ما تمني الله عطاه Over the years, the Hezbollah and the civilians have not been the only victims of the Israelis in southern Lebanon. used to be an Irish position which we had occupied in the central branch of village after you. But obviously we haven't been here recently. And this was the very room where Corporal Dermot McLaughlin was killed. He had come back from leave and he was sleeping here um, from the compound above Brashid compound. One Merkava, Israeli Merkava, fired a direct round here. Israeli tank. An Israeli tank, yeah. Um, his comrades were down below. They tried to get up the stairs, but the rubble had blocked the entrance to the room. They could hear him screaming. And within three minutes, a second tank round from the same position came in. Um, Anti-personnel flashed round and subsequently killed him. Um, Why? This is the big question. We found, we found out subsequently that the Israelis admitted it and the tank commander was disciplined. Um, but to the actual reason why he did it, why they did it, um, no one seems to know. Um, I suppose that they're trying to stop the locals from supporting Hezbollah. But, um, and does it succeed, this, this policy? I don't really think so. I, I think if, if people are going to support any of those organisations, they will. And uh, intimidating them by firing tank fire, I don't think will have any effect. Are there still Merkava? Tanks up there? Are there still yes, there? Um, a Merkava tank uh, last in the last five days has fired seven direct tank rounds into another house further to our east. In the same village? In the same village, yeah. And why? We haven't got the explanation for that one either, I'm afraid, Bob. This Red Cross delegate is taking a food parcel to a Muslim family in southern Lebanon which has no need of it. Officially, the food is to help them because one of their sons has been imprisoned without trial by the Israelis. 
and by bringing it to this remote Shiite village, the Swiss Red Cross man is greeted with warmth rather than suspicion. The family has plenty of food. The package, though real enough, is a device to maintain contact between the Red Cross and those who have suffered at Israeli hands. <laughs> Deep inside Israel's occupation zone lies a place called Hiam. Few in the West have heard of it, but in Lebanon, Hiam is notorious. Beyond the eye of the camera, more than 300 Shiites, some of them captured guerrillas, are held here by Israel's militia allies in Lebanon. Other prisoners are relatives of suspected Hezbollah members. These rare pictures of the jail give no idea of the conditions inside. Torture, according to Amnesty International, has been routine. <laughs> these people have uh, basic rights which have to be granted. They have to be able to get in contact with their families. Uh, the ICRC must be allowed to visit them and their cases have to be reviewed uh, at least twice a year. And none of these rights uh, are granted to, to these people. What pressure can you bring to bear on the Israelis? Our possibilities to make pressure uh, are very small. Uh, we can ask and ask and ask again. That, that's what we are doing since the existence of, of Hiam. The answer is still the same. It sounds, in a way, the mystery you talk about of Hiam prison, as if these people, in a way, are hostages. It is, it is that, that mystery which, which is used, uh, as, as I told you, to, to, to get news, to get information, either about uh, Israeli soldiers or people from, from their helping force in, in South Lebanon. Because the Israelis, in fact, want to swap. That's, uh, <laughs> that's what, what, what everybody says, yeah. yeah. Pascal, we used to hear an awful lot about Western hostages in Beirut. Why no fuss from anyone about these people? Well, what do you expect from the international community? Uh, there are, since 25 years, occupied territories uh, south of here. Uh, in 82, there was the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Since 82, this part of South Lebanon is occupied by Israel as well. It's, it's, it's become a habit. Hello, it's me, Robert Fisk, for Shabel. In English, en français, je suis Robert pour Shabel. Television. All attempts by the Red Cross and by Amnesty to enter the prison have been refused by Israel. Merely to approach the occupation zone can be dangerous. Fearful of guerrilla attacks and car bombers, the Israeli paid Lebanese militiamen at the front line allow only one person at a time to approach their checkpoint. Requests to visit Hiam are given short shrift. In response to a Hezbollah attack which killed eight Israeli soldiers inside the occupation zone, the Israelis last summer launched an air and artillery assault on the villages of southern Lebanon. Even as they were negotiating their secret peace with the PLO, the Israelis killed more than 130 Lebanese. Nine were guerrillas. The other 121 
were civilian men, women and children. The Israelis forced 300,000 civilians onto the roads as refugees. بعد ما كان الكسف على بلدة جبشيت هرب هو العائلة لهون على بلدة عبة أما العائلة ببيت وجع متطمن عبت عمه وأهله هو مارق على هالطريق وبنفس المكان محل موقف أني وإجا وإدا بسيارة نازل من صف جبشيت لهون والطيارة الحربية لحقتها وصل لهالمكان هوني صاحب السيارة وإجا الوالد عم يسأله السؤال شوف هي بالضيعة هون عم يطمن عن البيت إذا صاير له شيء وإذا بالطيارة كان ضاربة المطرحة هون وهالأزمة مثل ما شاف نزل هون حد منه بعد ما نزل الأزمة نزل حيط الباطون عليه هون والوالد استشهد بعد ما استشهد الوالد يعني بعد هالشي اللي عملته إسرائيل بعد هالشي اللي عملته إسرائيل كل كلنا منصور يعني ضد إسرائيل ومؤتن ضد إسرائيل Layla, she's a woman, 35 years old. Yes, she's burned for at 65 uh, percent of her body surface, 50 uh, percent third degree, and 15 second degree. Uh, she is very risky, badly burned. She has a possibility to die, 50 percent to die, 50 percent to recover, but she's very risky to die. الحريق تعبى فينا لانه نوع فوسفوري والثلاثه مع بعض ولعوا ثلاث طوابق مع بعض لوصل لنا نحن للارض هلا احترق جسمي كله جسمي كله محروق ظهري جري يدي جسمي كله محروق وامي نفس الشيء امي مره كبيره عمرها 82 سنه ما تحملت علاج المستشفى ست ست ايام توفت This is another uh, victim of shelling on South Lebanon. This old uh, lady, she she has 80 year old. She she were uh, living in Aitit uh, village in uh, Tir in the western uh, sector. So uh, during shelling, she developed injury. There there was a, a shrapnel penetrating her right patella and fracturing her uh, right femur and. She dropped down on the earth and she ha she had severe injury to the soft tissue and the muscle. They are sitting in our country, they are colonizing our country and they don't want us to fight against them. If I take your, uh, your house, you have to fight against me. So we are a freedom fighter here, all of us in Lebanon. Hassan Dimishkia and his wife had just put their three children to bed when the Israelis struck. Three of the children will catch fire. The first child is dead. The other one, 24 hours, is dead. I still I have one is admitted now. My wife is still admitted in the hospital now. My wife was eight months pregnant. So when this thing happened now, I bring it to the hospital with the children. The Red Cross brought us here. So we're still in operation now. 
and make operation and pull the baby out. But my wife is, you don't know about her two children dead. In fact, I was not in Lebanon for 20, 20 years. I was out of Lebanon. Yes, I just come to sit in my, my home to make my children learn our language. But no way, is there no grief for that? My heart is burning for my children. And even now, it's 12 night, I don't sleep. How deep does anger run in southern Lebanon? How great is the fury? How does a journalist calculate the frustration of ordinary men and women who've come to see themselves as perpetual victims of the West? Every year, the Shiite Muslims of Lebanon celebrate the death of Imam Hussein at the 7th century Battle of Karbala. It is a bloody and terrible spectacle, disgusting, appalling for a Westerner to behold. The young men who have razored open their heads are enacting the martyrdom of their long dead Imam who was betrayed by his fellow Muslims, just as the Muslims of Lebanon have so often felt betrayed by the West today. with the Zionism, who are kill us, or he are destroy us, he are destroy our home, he are destroy, he occupied our land. He are occupied now our land. We don't need power. The power from Allah. The victory, excuse me, the victory, not, we don't need. Allah, he gave us the victory. Yet in the town of Nabatea, in southern Lebanon, the Hezbollah have themselves condemned this ferocious spectacle. There is no blood ritual with them. When the Hezbollah remember the death of the Imam Hussein, they do so with a drumbeat of passion that is far more frightening. They have denounced the PLO's peace with Israel as a trick, an irrelevancy. The word God is on all their banners. Iran supports them. Syria, too, despite its participation in peace talks with Israel. No wonder the Israelis, flying high, watch them from the skies. Theology versus technology. Who will win?